outside who want to come in, please come in. Those inside who want to go outside, now you can go outside. Those who want to stay in the middle by the door, please sit by the door. Uh, this evening I do have a request for a talk. Uh, for those of you who don't know how we uh, organize these talks for a Friday evening, uh, I'm more than happy to be asked if there's a particular subject you want the monks to talk about that evening. That my training is not to be prepared when you give a talk. In fact, the only preparation is just making your mind peaceful and developing loving kindness. I think I might have told you how I was trained in Thailand by Ajahn Chah. That in the evenings, when there was about to be a talk, <coughs> he'd look at all the monks in the monastery. His eyes would go down the whole line of monks. If his eyes stopped at you, you were in big trouble. <laughs> he'd say, get up and give a talk. So no one knew when you had to give a talk. And I remember very clearly, I was only four years as a monk, and it was one of the biggest ceremonies of the whole year in Thailand, the full moon day in February, which is celebrated in Thailand as Madha Puja. Uh, we don't celebrate that too much here. We usually have the major celebrations on Waisak in May and the entry and exit from the rains retreat in uh, July and October, the three main ceremonies. But this was one of the biggest ceremonies, and all the monks had to go to the main monastery where there was hundreds of monks and thousands of people. On that occasion, my fourth rains retreat, Ajahn Chah decided he wouldn't give the main talk that evening. He looked down the line, <coughs> and when his eyes met mine, he went past, and I did a sigh of relief. But then his eyes went back up the line again <laughs> and stopped at me and said, Brother Wang, so get up and give a talk. I had to be in Thai. And that's the way you were trained. And because of that training, you're always able to give a talk at any time. Just the same way that if you really know your subject, if you really know, you know what you're talking about, you should be able to give a talk at any time on that. If you're an expert on, say, car mechanics or an expert on footy or something, you should be able to give a talk at any time. That's what being an expert is all about. But this evening that somebody asked me to give a talk because uh, they had a friend who was uh, experiencing some suffering and one of the worst parts of that suffering was nothing really to do with, with her but that one of the, the people in her class was dying. And it's how we deal with the suffering which we see in other people which sometimes we feel so frustrated about because we can't do anything. It seems that we're impotent, or should we do something? And the emotions which get caught up with seeing someone else in pain sometimes cause us even more pain. And it's an apt uh, subject for this evening's talk because uh, this is very close to the full moon in July, which is uh, coming up in a few days' time. And in the Buddhist calendar, that celebrates what we call the Buddha's first teaching, the Buddha's first sermon. In historical Buddhism, once the Buddha became enlightened, that was on Waisak in the full moon of May, he traveled uh, to a place called Sarnath, just outside of Benares, where he gave his first sermon, the heart of what Buddhism was all about. And that first sermon was very much on that problem of, you know, what to do with the suffering in life, where it comes from, how to deal with it. Because this is essential to our lives, and especially essential to religions. This hall here uh, has so many people every Friday night because of suffering. People were really happy and content, they'd stay at home. <laughs> 
As long as there's suffering in, in the world, there'll always be religions which try and answer those problems. And people come to a place like this, it might be the suffering because of death or because of disappointment, or because of uh, cancer, physical suffering. It can be suffering because of, again, uh, losing your job. Or it's also the suffering because of thinking too much as well, which is one of the other types of suffering which people have in this world. Sometimes the philosophers are the great sufferers in life. That's why the, the famous statue of a philosopher, Rodin's, Rodin's thinker, holding his poor head up. Those were the days before Panadol where you couldn't... <laughs> because this is a lot of suffering to think. And it's one of the great insights you have in meditation. You think because it's a problem. When there's no problems, there's no thinking. The silence of the mind is a sign of contentment. Silence is a sign of wisdom, of knowing. When you know, there are no questions come up. There's no thinking arises in the mind. All thinking is a disturbance of the tranquility of the mind. So people even come to this place because of the suffering of wanting to know. So the Buddha was talking about all these different types of suffering. And especially one of the wonderful things which was inspired me when I first came across Buddhism was an acknowledged suffering. Acknowledging it as part of life rather than something going wrong. I always remember my father when I ever taught him about religion that he said that for the best will in the world he could not accept the usual idea of a god simply because that he'd been in the English town of Liverpool during the Second World War and saw not only his own parents die but saw many of his friends and other relations die in that great war and you know, not die nice deaths, die very painful deaths you know, through the carnage of war being blown up, losing limbs and he said that he could never believe in a God which was powerful and compassionate. If there was a powerful God, then surely that would never allow such things. And that problem of suffering, especially if there's like a, a God who is a, a controller, seems to, again, give many problems to people. And in the Buddhist religion, they say, well, look, even if there is a God, they haven't got such power because suffering is, it's a part of life. And no god, no priest, no monk has the power to stop the suffering in human life. One of the reasons is, is because if you look at what suffering is, you see that it is part and parcel of the happiness of life. This is one of the difficulties which people have, this wishful thinking, thinking this is some sort of heaven realm, this is some wonderful place, we should only have happiness and everything should go right in this world. And when things go wrong, we vote out the government, or we divorce our husband, or we leave our job, or we try and find some other way of solving the problem, but not really looking at it square in the face, and saying that this is life. You suffer. One of the Buddhist sayings is like a soldier who gets shot and wounded and says, why me? Why did I get shot? This is unfair. And of course, you know the answer. Why did you get shot? Because you joined the army. That's what happens to soldiers. You're putting yourself in the firing line. That's why you get hurt. And it's the same in the Buddhism. We say that if you take a human birth, you're liable to all these different types of suffering. What we're actually saying here is becoming real, that with birth, there has to be death. With happiness, there has to be suffering. For every time you smile, there'll be tears coming later. For every time you cry, there'll be happiness after. 
that this is the reality of life. And if you go deeper into this, especially one of the wonderful things with the Buddhist way of meditation is that it clears away all the dogmas, clears away not only the religious dogmas, but the individual dogmas, what you want to believe in. That's the dogmas inside of you. Instead of like a religious dogma where you, you don't want to face the truth because it says in the books that this is this, this. Sometimes human beings are dogmatic. They don't believe in the truth because they think it says in your book inside it has to be this way. But the wonderful thing with Buddhist meditation is that you get rid of all of those dogmas. You have to set them all aside. And to take truth, reality, experience, life as your Bible, as your Tipitaka, as your teachings. And then you find that what's actually in the books is actually the guide, it's a map, it's not the reality. As they say in Zen Buddhism, it's a finger pointing at the moon. But don't mistake the finger from the moon it's pointing to. That's what the books are, the fingers. And the moon is your experience. And especially when you put aside all the dogmas inside of you, what you want to believe in, that life must be happy, that life must be good, that life must be enjoyable, that I must live to 70, 80 years of age and I must find my perfect partner in life and live happily ever after, or find my perfect monk to be a nice teacher. He's always around to teach me at any time I want. Whatever else it is you want to have in life, come on, get real. <laughs> now if you look at life how many of you have ever been sick put your hands up if you've never been sick at all come on be honest if you have, hands up if you've been healthy all your life ok so you've all been sick correct so it looks like it's pretty normal to be sick so why is it that we say there's something wrong with me? I'm sick today. <laughs> Put your hands up if you're not going to die. <laughs> so you're all going to die, correct? So why do we think that something's gone wrong when one of us dies? So that what we want to believe in, what's real, are two different things. So if we're really courageous and devoted to truth, we have to put aside what we want to see, what we want to believe in, and go for the truth. That life means death. When someone's born, it means they're going to die. And the whole process of life, what's the meaning of life? The meaning of life is you're going to die. <laughs> It's really, it's what happens in between is the most important part. And what happens in between is all the training how to die. In the same way that when you go to school or university, everything you do all year, all those lectures, those assignments, those tutorials, that's all for the final examination, for the degree. And if you pass that degree, you don't have to repeat the course again. Get the message? <laughs> if, you, if you stuff up this lifetime and you don't die well, you're going to have to come back again. Don't think you're finished with school. Don't think you're finished with nappies. Each one of you, <laughs> reincarnation, rebirth, you're going to have to go back in nappies again and go to school all over again. And those of you who are retired and think, now you're happy, you're going to have to go to work again. Imagine that Monday mornings all over again. Unless you get it right, just like at a school, you pass your exams. But the whole of this life is about learning. And that's why a very good description of suffering is growing pains. When you call it growing pains, it looks upon the disappointments of suffering in life as teachers, as opportunities to learn. The way I was taught in Thailand. It's just that. You know that my, my first name is Ajahn, Ajahn Ram. We've got Sister Ajahn Wayan. We've got my teacher Ajahn Cha. 
The word Ajahn is a Thai word, which comes from the Pali Sanskrit word of Acharya, meaning teacher. That's what that word means, just teacher. When I was in Thailand, when I was bothered by these mosquitoes who would bite you all day long, the trouble with the Thai mosquitoes, they've been genetically programmed over many years of knowing monks to know that monks were a safe dinner. Put monks because of rules. Because I'm a monk, great. Frida, no problems. That saves so many parts of our body, you've got more skin to aim for. So, <laughs> the Thai <laughs> mosquitoes in Thailand would cause you a lot of problems. When you complained about the mosquitoes, to your teacher Ajahn Chai, he said, ah, Ajahn Mosquito. He asked us to call them Ajahn Mosquito, teacher mosquito. And that actually put it, the whole experience in a different light. You were learning from these things. These were teaching you something. In the same way when you were sick, it was a teaching experience. That's why the first or second year in Thailand, I was sick with typhus fever in hospital for about three or four weeks. It was actually over the Christmas period. So it was supposed to be Christmas and I felt really awful in hospital. This was a third world country hospital. The six o'clock, this is a monk's ward. There was a nurse on duty, disappeared. And I was waiting, when's the night nurse coming? The monk next to me said, there is no night nurse. If you happen to get sick or die at night, that's bad karma. Bad luck, better luck next time. The nurse didn't come back until six o'clock the following morning. Help, take me home. <laughs> But Ajahn Chah, my great teacher, he actually came to see me in hospital. And I felt so elated, so uplifted, until he opened his mouth. Because <laughs> he said, the famous, this is what he used to say, he said, Grandma Wang So, he said, and I was waiting for some nice kind words, like, how are you, how you doing, are you feeling well? He said, you're either going to get better or you're going to die. And then he left. <laughs> Thank you very much. But you couldn't blame it because that was deep teaching. What he was actually saying was that don't get depressed or disappointed with the experience of being really sick with a terrible fever in hospital. Learn from it. Another growing pain is Ajahn Typhus fever. And it's, you, you do learn from these things. How much do you learn from having a good time? You don't learn very much, do you? In fact, you learn complacency selfishness when things go well for you. Whenever there's a suffering in life, disappointment, frustration, when things don't go well, these are marvelous opportunities to learn and to grow. That's why that one of the similes which I give, some of you have heard it so many times, truckload of dung simile. It's like you come to a lovely talk when you go back home, you find that someone has dumped 10 cubic meters of the most smelly, offensive dung right in front of your door of your house. There's two things about that dung. Number one, you didn't order it. <laughs> Not your fault. And secondly, no one saw it coming, so you can't ring up someone to get it taken away. You're stuck with it. This is what happens in life, isn't it? The dung stands for the trouble, the problems in life. Smelly, offensive, terrible to experience. But first of all, we don't know why me. Secondly, we can't get someone to take it away. You can't just get someone to magic away your typhus fever. You can't get someone to magic away the problems in your relationship. You can't get a magic wand. Sort of... Bring back you know, the, the son, the father, the wife, the daughter who's died. You're stuck with it. There's two things which people do with dung in this simile. The first person puts it in their pockets, in their bag, up their shirt, down their skirt, trousers. And they carry it around with them. And you find, if you carry around dung, that you lose a lot of friends. <laughs> Quite naturally. In that simile, it means you carry around your suffering with you. 
always talking about it, always telling other people how terrible it is. Understandable, yeah, but you lose a lot of friends. The other way to deal with dung, which you've all heard this before, you've got a garden, dig it in. Dig in your dung. Great fertilizer. And people who do that, they dig in the dung of their life, the suffering in their life, they learn from it, they grow from it, they grow this amazing garden. Compassion, wisdom, endurance, all the great spiritual qualities which make a rich human being. When you've really been through terrible experiences, when you really know how it feels to be right deep in there, will you ever pass by someone else who's experiencing the same? You've really been hungry. You'd never give, stop giving to someone who's also hungry. You've never been cold. You will never fail to give warm to someone else. If you've ever felt real loneliness, be so friendly towards other people. Very often it's a suffering which teaches us to be kind. This is why we grow from the suffering of life. If we stop carrying these things around and we dig it in. It's hard work. We get these beautiful fruits of suffering. The mangoes from our trees are so much sweeter than the person's next door. Our flowers are so richer and more fragrant than the person's next door. Why? Because of all the dung we've had in our life. So, in Buddhism, we accept that suffering is, it's a part of life. There's opportunities to learn, opportunities to grow. But when we experience this suffering, we great opportunity is to become wise and understand. Now, the biggest question when, say, cancer hits or a sudden death happens or we get you know, divorced because our relationship falls apart or whatever else it is, you say, why? We want to know the answer to that question. Why does this happen? And to find that, the answer to that question, why? But we really have to look where suffering lies. And so often, when we look at the question why, we're looking for someone to blame. It's his fault, or it's God's fault, or it's you know, the government's fault, it's Mr. Howard's fault, or whatever else it is. It's amazing how much we blame on the governments. That's why you have to be a fool to want to be a prime minister. You're just asking for trouble, to asking to cop it. So, we always want to blame somebody. This is what Ajahn Chah used to say, that it's when you've got an itch on your head and you scratch your bottom. If you've got an itch on your head and you scratch your bottom, does the itch ever go away? This is what happens when we blame someone else. Because when there's a problem there, where is suffering? Remember Ajahn Sumato, one of the senior monks, he's now the abbot of the monasteries in England. He was having a hard time in the early days of the monastery in Thailand. The food was disgusting, the mosquitoes were voracious, the, uh, the accommodation was terrible, and he was suffering. One day Ajahn Chah came up to him and said, you're suffering. Is it the monastery that's suffering or you that's suffering? And he realized he was blaming the monastery. The monastery is not suffering. The suffering lied, lay in him, inside. Don't think it's a job which is suffering. Your husband, your wife is suffering. But life is suffering. You are suffering. When you see where the suffering lies, then you can start to do something about it. You can scratch in the right place. Don't go around blaming other people. Don't go around blaming the place you're in. Don't go around blaming life. This is what life is. 
It's like when people have relationships. There's a lot of happiness, but a lot of suffering in relationships. And sometimes people think, why? You know, the amount of suffering in a relationship is directly measured by the amount of happiness you have in it. The two go together. Happiness and suffering. This is called duality. Well, the happiest time in your life? Getting married. Suff- most suffering time in your life? Your divorce. Why is that? The reason is, is that happiness is just the gap between two moments of suffering. Suffering is the gap between two moments of Happiness. What are the most happiest times of your life so far? When you've had happiness, why? Why was that happy? You know sometimes the euphoria which people have when their their footy team wins. Look at all the suffering people have because of the Eagles and the Dockers. Why is that? Because of all the happiness which what Essendon and someone else gets. Imagine like sort of the, the West Australia footy teams won every year. Every year they all won. Now would that be any joy to that? It's only because they lose, 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 lose. But when they do win, then there's happiness, there's euphoria. It's just like in the Olympic Games. So when Kathy Freeman wins, why is that so euphoric? Because of all the other people who lose, that's why. <laughs> If everybody won, there would be no happiness and joy there. The very fact that you are happy when you finish your exams is because of all the suffering which goes into studying for them. Look at the happiness which you have in life and see that it's measured by the amount of suffering that went on before. Years ago, I was meeting somebody at Perth Airport. Before the, the monk came through, there was a lot of Baha'is, refugees, were coming in to Perth that day. They were Iranians before the Islamic Revolution pushed them out of their homeland. Many of them had been tortured, many of them had lost their family, had been killed. They had fled to Pakistan leaving everything they had behind. They've been in refugee camps for three or four years, again, with nothing except hope. Now they've reached a Western country. When they came through those doors into the airport, they literally jumped up in the air, clapped, danced, and shouted. I found myself jumping up in the air, (laughs) clapping and shouting as well. I couldn't think why. I was taken up in the euphoria. It was, the whole airport was just dancing. And I thought, why was it that those people were some of the happiest people I've ever seen in my life on that occasion? And I thought about that afterwards. The happiness was a measure of all they'd suffered before. When you look at this, You see that happiness and suffering come in equal portions in life. And you cannot have one without the other. If you imagine a heaven realm. A heaven realm where you have nothing but happiness. Nothing but happiness. Is that possible? Imagine your favorite food. Imagine your favorite TV program. Imagine it being repeated every day for 300, 400 years. Wouldn't you get fed up? (laughs) This is what the problem is. With sensory experience, with seeing, with hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, even thinking. Because things are changing, happiness is just that which is better than what went before. But it can't always be better. It always has to be measured by something which is worse. I recalled reading an article years ago about one of these 
uh, gourmets who had spent his whole life going to expensive restaurants, cooking and tasting the delights of the palate. And he lived in France where they got the best chefs in the world. And I think there's only ever two or three five-star restaurants. And he said whenever he went to a four-star restaurant, he was just so suffering. Because the food wasn't just quite up to that sort of, that peak he'd had before. As for me, if I went to a four-star restaurant, it would be amazing. Because I, whatever, if I do get good food, anyway, it all gets put in the same bowl with all the sweets and everything else. And we get mixed up. The trouble with being a monk, when you do get your food which you like, you get food which you don't like at the same time. And it all gets mixed up. Because we all were eating one bowl. <laughs> Remember once this this one monastery I was staying in England that had somebody who worked for a custard company. And so he used to drop all this custard off and every day he used to have whole big bowls of custard. And this one day, because he used to pass the food out, you know, a couple of monks had to hold this big bowl of custard and we pass the monks bowls and put a dollop in each one. And I saw these monks looking at me with both fear and with hope said, please don't put the custard over my curry. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of suffering being a monk <laughs> so sometimes you do get what you do want but you know you do get sort of rotten curry put on top of it or the other way around but anyway even the terrible food which I used to have in Thailand that when the food was one day not as terrible as the day before that was delicious and this is what we talk about happiness and suffering in life because that it's relative to each other, that you can't have one without the other. This is how, what you learn from, that suffering is a part of life, it's part of happiness, that happiness and suffering have to go together as a pair. So you can't get out of this with a heaven realm or any other realm of existence. We have to take both. The point is, once we start to accept that both happen, we get what's called mental peace. That mental peace comes from like accepting. Yeah, this is happening. Yeah, let's try and do something with it to be at peace with it. When there's something you can't change, when you can't do anything, you know that famous Buddhist saying, when there's nothing to do, then do nothing. When there's something to do, give it everything you've got. So in the case of a sickness, or a problem, a difficulty, if there's something you can do, again, do something. Years ago, when I was a school teacher, one of my fellow school teachers, a soldier in the British Army, Second World War, fighting in Burma, he told me this story. He said, which changed his whole life. It's a good Buddhist story. He was with a small group of soldiers in the jungles, Second World War. They stumbled into a whole battalion of Japanese troops. They were completely surrounded and outnumbered. He thought he was about to die. His idea was to try and fight their way through. Maybe they would die, but they could take some of the enemy with them. That was a patriotic thing to do. But his major, his commanding officer, said no. Instead, he said, let's all sit down and have a cup of tea. The British Army. <laughs> they used to win many wars. So he thought his commanding officer was completely out of his mind and crazy. But orders were orders. They had to sit down and make a cup of tea. In the time it took them to start making their tea, the scout came back and said, put your things away quickly. The enemy's moved. We can escape. Which they did. Which is why he could tell me the story. He owed his life to the wisdom of that commanding officer. When there was nothing to do, sit down and have a cup of tea. What you're doing is... Resting, preserving your energies, 
not panicking. And because life is always changing, the circumstances are always altering, it means when things do change, and there is something you can do, you're ready and prepared. They escaped, and he said, he used that simile not once, but many times in his life, when there's nothing to do, sit down and have a cup of tea, do nothing. So you're keeping your energies for a time when you can be effective. So with the suffering of life, a lot of times there's nothing we can do physically. So we can rest. What that resting is, is what we call in Buddhism, is just having single suffering rather than double suffering. Double suffering means when there's a problem, there's a difficulty, and I don't want it. It shouldn't be this way. We're adding mental suffering the physical suffering. The physical suffering in the world, in Buddhism, in real life, is saying we can do nothing about. Death happens. Sickness happens. Arguments happen. Differences of opinion happen. Stock markets go up, stock markets go down. We make fortunes and then we're broke. If you're broke, don't worry, you can always come and join me in the monastery. <laughs> <So> <laughs> You can always get something to eat there. Even if it is all in the same bowl, all mixed together. It's better than being hungry. <laughs> but, because this actually happens, suffering happens, at least we can say we're not going to add mental suffering to the problem. And as far as your own experience is concerned, it's a mental suffering which is the worst part of suffering. Having cancer is not as bad as not wanting to have cancer. Actually, being divorced is not so bad as the mental turmoil which goes on in your mind at the time. The death of someone is no one near as bad as the suffering which goes on in the minds of those who are left behind. The so mental suffering is by far the worst. And the reason why we have that mental suffering is because I don't want this. This shouldn't happen. Why me? It's a mental complaining which comes from not understanding. What suffering is teaching us is this is part of life. We can accept and let go. And then we can actually appreciate the great benefits which these experiences give us in life. First of all, we know it will never last in the same way that happiness never lasts. Suffering never lasts either. It's a very good Buddhist teaching, basic teaching. But you can't really call it Buddhist. It's actually part of life. It's in the Buddhist uh, tradition. The emperor's ring. An emperor had... He was a young emperor. He wasn't all that skillful. Whenever things went well in his kingdom, he would have a party and celebration. Always having holidays. Celebrating the happiness, prosperity in the kingdom. Because of that, he would never do enough work to keep the prosperity going. So when the economy went down, when the enemies on the borders were threatening to invade, when the people weren't happy, he went to his room and sulked got depressed. Because he was alternating between partying and being depressed, he could never really do the work of an emperor. So the ministers met together. They wanted to try and help the young man become a more effective ruler. And they came up with this very simple solution to present their monarch with a ring. A simple gold ring, except for what was written on the outside, was this too will pass. It was engraved on the outside of the ring. And that emperor had to wear the ring on all occasions. I'd always keep looking at that ring. This too will pass. This too will pass. When things were going wrong in the kingdom, when there was problems, this too will pass. So he never got so depressed that he became incapable. 
even though things were going wrong. He knew it would pass. It would go sooner or later. So he kept on working. He had hope. More importantly, when things were going well, the country was booming, he always remembered this too will pass. The bad times will come soon. So he worked even harder. He never took prosperity and happiness for granted. How many of us take our health, our happiness, our prosperity for granted? This too will pass. What it means is we work harder to appreciate our loved ones, to appreciate the day, to appreciate our health, to appreciate our society, our country, to keep it going. Never taking anything for granted, because this too will pass. It makes the good times even happier, and makes them last longer. And the bad times, this too will pass, this too will pass. Whether it's grief, disappointment, if you fail your exams, it doesn't matter. This too will pass. You'll find something else to do later on. If you probably fail all your exams, you can always become a monk or a nun. <laughs> this too will pass. If you're broken up with your boyfriend or girlfriend, this too will pass. It always passes, doesn't it? And if you're sick in hospital with typhus fever, this too will pass. You'll either get better or you'll die, but it will pass. <laughs> What that does is stop the mental suffering which happens. If there's something you can do, you do something. If something you can't do, do nothing. This is being effective in life. The Buddha said the cause of the main cause of the problem of suffering is craving, the mental desire to try and change what you cannot change. Fighting when there's, there's no we can't fight it. It's trying to Fight the surrounding Japanese army when we should really be sitting down and having a cup of tea. Letting go. And when we understand this is part of suffering, we realize the, the way to overcome that suffering, the suffering in the world, we can't do much about. We can help it, we can be compassionate and kind, but the suffering inside is when we learn how to let go when it's time to let go. When someone dies, we have to let them go. We can't keep carrying them around year after year. That's being crazy. It's the same when someone says something we don't like. Don't keep carrying it around. That's being crazy. We can learn how to let go. How many of you suffer because someone says something terrible or wrong to you? They call you a fool or an idiot. And you get really angry at it. You know the Buddha's response to that? The story of the man who went to buy eggs in the market. This man had an afternoon off work. His wife was busy cooking dinner. She ran out of eggs. And she asked, husband dear, you've got the free afternoon. Would you mind going to the market to get me some eggs? Sure, no problem, darling. So he took the basket and went to the next village where the market was for the very first time. I went into the market. And as soon as he went into this market, this big man came up to him and called him, you're the most ugliest person I've ever seen in my life. And you look stupid to me. And this husband said, what are you talking to me about? I don't even know you. Yeah, you're so stupid, you don't know anybody. You're ugly, you probably smell and stink. You've got a face like a, like a camel. And he started abusing this husband and calling him names and swearing at him. And the husband got so upset, said, what are you doing this to me for? I don't even know you. But this fellow abused him and cursed him so much that the husband got so upset, he turned around and went straight back home. As soon as he got in the door of his home, his wife said, you're back early, dear. Yes. You got the eggs? No. And I don't want to go to that market ever again. Why, darling? <laughs> I'll try to make it, make it sound a good story. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, when, the, when she got it out of him, why he was upset, she said, oh, it's him. He said, look, that poor fellow abuses and curses and says rotten things to everybody. 
So when he was very small, he fell on his head, and he hurt himself, and his brain has never been the same. And he always does that. He curses everybody. He curses me, but don't take any notice of him. He's crazy. But when the husband found out that he'd been abused just by a person who was crazy, instead of feeling angry and upset, he felt a lot of compassion on the poor thing. It must be terrible having an accident like that, never being able to work and being disabled. So the wife said, please go back to the, the market and get some eggs. He said, no trouble. And when he went back into the market, this guy came up to him again and cursed him, called him a fool, an idiot, stupid, terrible words. He even swore at him. It doesn't matter because he's crazy. When he went up to the egg store, the man followed him and called him all sorts of names. And he said to the woman behind the egg store, he said, the guy's crazy. He said, yeah, she, he's crazy. He says that to me sometimes, poor thing. He hit his head when he was young. And because he knew the man was crazy, he could go and buy his eggs and go back home again. It didn't matter at all, because he was crazy. And the Buddha told that story. He said, if anyone curses you or calls you a fool, remember the story of the madman in the market. They're just crazy. If it's your husband gets angry at you, they're just crazy. <laughs> if, your wife, if your wife starts to abuse you, they're just crazy. <laughs> they must have hit their head. Well, it's true, because isn't it the case that when someone abuses you, curses you, calls you a name, it's temporary insanity. No one in their right mind would call anyone else an idiot or a fool. How can I judge someone else? So when anyone does judge you and call you bad names, it's just crazy they're a fool. <laughs> must have hit their head this morning. <laughs> so what that means is we don't carry the mental suffering. Physical suffering, yes, but we don't have to make a huge, big problem out of it, mentally. This is where the Buddha said, craving, not wanting to be that way, wanting to be something different, is a cause of the suffering in life. When we can let go, letting go means like flowing with life, being with things which we cannot change. So we can actually take on board the fact that death happens, sickness happens, divorces happen. We can learn from this, we can grow from this, we can become wonderful people because of this. We learn so much. These are growing pains in our life. So we don't look upon disappointments as something bad or wrong. We look upon it as opportunities to understand what this life is all about. We're using life as our textbook. We're using our experiences as ways of learning the lessons. And that's why when you find that you know how to let go, when it's time to let go, you can be at peace no matter what happens to you in life. Because who makes these rules anyway? For what life is supposed to be? The way life is supposed to be is the way life is. People are being, getting sick and dying. They've been having arguments ever since time immemorial. So welcome to life. This is how life actually is, physically. But it doesn't have to be this way mentally. We can learn and be at peace with these things. One of the biggest mental problems is not accepting, thinking this is wrong, it shouldn't be this way. We're trying to change something which we can never change. There was an old story in Buddhism about this man who lost his only son. And he was so upset, he would go to the cremation ground every night after work, cry his eyes out and call out for his son, please come back, please come back. The family allowed him to grieve for a week. But when he kept going back to that crematorium, day out, night after night, two weeks, three weeks, he wasn't eating, he wasn't sleeping, he was getting sick and haggard, and he couldn't do his business. So the family had to do something. They couldn't let him go on like this. The grieving was going too far. So they hired an actor about the same age as his son told the actor what to do. That night the actor went to that cemetery as, as well and was crying his eyes out. And so was the father of the, the, the son who died, was crying his eyes out. The two of them met together, crying together. 
And so they asked each other, so what are you crying for? The father asked the actor, he didn't know he was an actor, what are you crying for? He said, oh, today was my birthday. And my father promised to get me whatever I wanted for my birthday. And he broke his promise. That's why I'm so sad, I'm crying. And the father who lost his son said, look, I'm a rich man. You look so much like my son. I want you to be happy. What is it you wanted for your birthday? I'll get it for you. And the, the actor sort of smiled and said, really, can you get me what I want for my birthday?